So good afternoon. Uh, my name is Taro. I'm from Osaka University. I'm currently uh, stationed in Tokyo to run a uh, Osaka University's ASEAN Center, which is located in Paso. And uh, I'm also a visiting professor at Chicago University of Philosophy the Faculty of Arts. So um, the title is Still Continuing After Fukushima. And in Japan, uh, after almost six years, uh, six, almost six years after uh, the Fukushima nuclear disaster, the present, the present government, uh, I guess you know the name of the Prime Minister, uh, Abe, uh, has been, he has been pushing for the pro-nuclear agenda and that he tries to normalize normalize I put the brackets uh, he tries to, to normalize the situation in Fukushima and, uh, so uh, ori uh, originally I read this paper uh, Uh, in an international conference which was held uh, two years ago at Asan Chan University in Tehran. And uh, the main theme of the conference was uh, intergenerational ethics. So I gave my talk uh, under the title of uh, How Do We uh, Redeem the Lost Future After Fukushima? And uh, this paper has just been published uh, in this book. So uh, I don't read the paper. I just summarize the points that I put in my paper. So the original title is How to Redeem the Lost Future After Krishna Says of Guilt, Memory, and Redemption. And uh, contextualizing uh, the Fukushima nuclear disaster, which is uh, usually referred as 3.11, uh, like uh, other incidents, uh, is a kind of uh, philosophical, historical insight. And, uh, a Japanese philosopher, uh, Shunsuke Tsurui, uh, contextualizes uh, the Fukushima nuclear disaster in, in line with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, as Hiroshima and Nagasaki were the nightmare, Fukushima was also a nightmare for not only for Japanese, but also for the entire world. And uh, uh, if we contextualize the Fukushima nuclear disaster in the post-war uh, history of Japan, uh, it is obvious that uh, so-called peaceful use of atomic energy policy was agreed uh, in line with the security agreement between the United States and Japan. Um, uh, three years after uh, the US occupation of Japan, of Japan uh, in 1955, uh, agreement for uh, cooper and cooperation and concerning the civil use of atomic energy between the US and Japan was ratified. And uh, Japan uh, pushed forward the, the uh, nuclear power generation policy until Fukushima. And uh, even after Fukushima, uh, the product, as, I, as I explained earlier, uh, the present government is pushing forward uh, and uh, to 
transition for the, the nuclear power generation policy. The present government still continues. And so my question was, my question is, is normalizing nuclear catastrophe, uh, nuclear catastrophe, a responsible attitude for the future generation? Not only of Fukushima, but also of the entire Japanese people. And, and uh, in this paper, in the uh, later part of the paper, uh, I uh, uh, try to approach the issue uh, from the viewpoint of uh, Tsurumi Shunsuke's concept of the ability to lose, as well as uh, losers' memory and imagination. So today, I'd like to, to focus on this concept of losers' imagination.
catastrophe, a responsible attitude for the future generation of Krishna? The answer is no. And I'd like to focus on the question number two. How can we redeem the lost future of Krishna, which is actually the title of my paper? So how can we redeem the lost future of Krishna? Um, since I, because I am a philosopher, I am very interested in the structure, uh, temporal structure of this question. Um, I think uh, this question is retrospective question and prospective question at the same time. Since, because re 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 redemption uh, refers to the past and the future at the same time. So, um, in other words, if we, if we can redeem the lost future of Krishna, uh, we prospect for the future through retrospective assessment of the past. That is how we can redeem, how we can reclaim the lost future of Krishna. Can you say that again? Yeah, I, I, just, I just repeat. We, we prospect for the future through with retrospective assessment of the past. That is how we can redeem, how we can reclaim the lost future of the people. And uh, this brings us to the concept of loser's imagination. A loser looks forward to the future through, uh, through looking back on the past, assessing mistakes committed, and reorienting the course of his life. This is how a loser, how a loser, uh, irrational loser. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the rational loser imagines the future. Yeah. Uh, he looks back on the past, assessing the mistakes committed, and he reorients the course of his life. Yeah. He changes his uh, way of life. Yeah. And uh, the problem is how how do Japanese people organize a collective imagination of the people as a loser in collective. I think Fukushima was a defeat. Just like Japan was defeated by, uh, you know, uh, Japan, was, Japan was defeated in the, the World War II. So Fukushima was the second defeat in uh, with the modern history of Japan. And so uh, how do we, how do Japanese people organize a collective imagination of the people? This is the question. And I think uh, we need to bring the loser's imagination into public sphere. And second, we need to discuss uh, this uh, this issue, and we reorient the Japan's future. Yeah. So um, this is a tentative conclusion, tentative answer to my own question. Uh, uh, Japanese people have to organize a collective imagination in a public sphere, discuss it, and then we need to reorient Japan's future as a loser. So thank you very much. Can I, uh, before we have a question, can I just borrow, I'll put it back here later. Uh, since I was uh, in Fukushima months ago uh, at the power plant, I'd like to show some pictures. You been there? Yeah. So this is a, um, a 
for our Skype friends, I'm going to share the screen so they can uh, see the pictures. Uh, so this is a, uh, this, you can drive very close to Fukushima. In fact, my home is uh, in Ibaraki, which is the uh, state just underneath Fukushima. And this is a, a guide counter which says 3.240 microsilverts per hour. Now, if you calculate the number of hours in a year, how many hours in a year? Do you know? 24 times 365. Yeah? So basically, eight, nine hours, is that right? Yeah. 9,000 times 3 uh, is uh, uh, 27, so 28 millisilverts per year is the sort of figure that this is. Now, in times of nuclear disaster, the uh, maximum per year, it was always increases from 1 millisilver per hour per year to uh, 20 millisilverts per year. The same happened in Fukushima as happened in Chernobyl. And after 20 or 30 years, they reduce it back because they can't leave it at 1 millisilver per year because they have to evacuate too many people. So they uh, increase the safety limit. Uh, but you can drive down to the main highway. Now, is it this stretch of road you're not likely to drive on a motorcycle, only in cars. And believe it or not, I use the rental car. <laughs> Uh, which is probably a good idea. And then you can see the road at people's uh, houses uh, you cannot uh, go to because they have a gates here. So it's, it's a bit like a ghost town, and that's what Tara was talking about is in terms of having the uh, suddenly saying some part of us you can, you can do freely. Uh, so everyone moved out of the city? Yeah, because it immediately, after two or three days, it became an evacuation zone with the sign. So this is the side streets uh, you're not allowed to go into. Yeah. This is a warning stones. This is another guy who counted. It's a bit more healthier figure, 0.2 instead of 3.2. This is the seawall. Uh, the top soil that's contaminated is put into black bags and it's taken from the top soil, it's taken from people's houses and it's being used to back up the back of the seawall to make the seawall stronger. You put concrete and then you put the contaminated soil next to the ocean and then it's sort of a way to dilute out the problem. Uh, and these are kind of extra seawalls along here. Uh, you can see that these are trees that you know, have tsunami damage to be driven into the coast. The branches are all It's a last thing. This is the uh, science's Great East Japan earthquake tsunami in the Dutchman section start. So there's even a memorial. This is where the tsunami uh, started uh, to flood this area of land. This is another. These are various vehicles. This is a view of the Fukushima Daiichi power plant from the north, about one kilometer away. This is as close as I could get without uh, jumping the fence. I'm looking very serious here. And these are, they're still taking topsoil away. And then the gas stations which have just been, these are the, Lines going in, and this is says, Welcome to Fukushima Daiichi nuclear uh, power station. It's uh, 1.5 kilometers past my And so it's, it's still got a sign saying, Welcome. <laughs> and then I went to, uh, I drove in, as far as I could to Daiichi uh, power plant. But the police were, the, they kind of, uh, I pretended I was naive, and they kind of, uh, I pretended to be a horror and then I was saying a sort of comment to a guy such an idiot doesn't you know what happened here. And then I was, I was just saying, you know, saying that, you know, what's the other 
and he's about to pop off and people are sort of sides. So these are just the exclusions are, but compared to when I went to, to start the brewery, the accident, the exclusions are was much worse than the this sign says after this uh, this is the difficult to return zone. This is that. Now also in this area there were sprinkler systems for your car if you wanted to wash your cars. Uh, if you residents uh, just outside of this area you can still get washed. And the weeds, so the biodiversity aspects are interesting because they're like to know a lot of uh, those people. And then I have one one other thing I want to show you. I had a class, an AUSM class, from the nuclear reactor before I did that sort of crazy thing. And um, we talked about nuclear ethics. Why not work from the nuclear reactor? Uh, I wasn't arrested, unfortunately. But it has some very interesting science over here. from next to the nuclear reactor. What does it say? Live safe at home, at work, on the road. So it's by a public health sign. The other side, and this is Palo Verde. Warning, commercial nuclear generating station property boundary is a felon trespass. And then this is safety and efficiency. Uh, generating electricity for the long term. So the long term, this is used in public ethics, what we talked about intergenerational responsibilities. This is a, uh, and this is another sign, putting some green in the desert. This is a class I had at the uh, reactor. So, I, I did the class as close as I could. It was like uh, 600 meters from the main reactors. So said this is no video. And so I just got out and I did the class and showed the video with a video Skype. This is the, so you can go quite close. Uh, so that's um, just an aside of some of the issues you mentioned, both from the uh, So, uh, Tara raised a number of questions, which she has on the computer, and uh, thank you for raising them. And I think these two papers are interesting in their perspectives as to what sort of questions. I have a question. Yes, sir, Sam. Um, thank you, Daryl. Um, very fascinating uh, question you raised there. Um, in a way, I found it relative to my topic um, because I was um, thinking of the law of attraction. Um, and you said the second defeat, uh, meaning there was a, another defeat that may have prepared the ground for the second defeat. I'm assuming that's what you meant. So I wonder if the law of attraction brought that out. And since you want to fix that, you want basically the Japanese people to take ownership of that defeat, address it publicly, decolonize the information to use Daryl's um, phrase. 
And I'm wondering if Japan can only succeed in doing that, meaning to take ownership of the defeat is by a win. They need to win in something first that can be celebrated and internalized by the entire population of Japan to sort of wipe out the stigma or the memory or the whatever it is that is lingering in the air is World War II. Um, so then you have a win followed by another win, followed by another win, and then you put an end to this, what is going to look like a cycle of So, in short, do you think Japan needs a win, something to win first, before it can actually stop this vicious cycle? Okay. Thank you very much for your <laughs> question and comment. <laughs> um, the, the famous uh, John Dower's book, the title is um, Embracing Defeat, which is a memorial book uh, describing the, the post-war uh, public situation after, right after the World War II. And uh, according to John Dower, right after the defeat in World War II, Japanese people were quite happy and embraced the defeat because people were relieved. And uh, you know, people thought the war was over. They uh, no longer have to fight. And people were happy. They embraced the defeat. And then, uh, in two years later, uh, Japan, uh, in cooperation with the United States, uh, Japan uh, had a new constitution, which is called a peace constitution and which is now under the revision by the present government and then they want to delete the article 9 of the peace constitution because I guess you know the article 9 of the Japanese constitution which prohibits uh, Japan to have a military military force so uh, relating to win of Japan I think uh, you know, um, this peace constitution, including Article 9 of, uh, of uh, the Article 9, uh, I mean, this peace constitution of Japan was a kind of symbol of win right after the defeat. It is, uh, this country's constitution keeps Japan peaceful. And maybe economic growth, uh, which was achieved during the 70, 70s, uh, was also a sort of win for Japan. And, uh, you know, uh, during the period of the 70s, uh, Japan developed nuclear uh, plants as well in parallel, mm -hmm. and uh, which led Japan to another defeat. So, um, <coughs> by reorienting the future of the people, as you uh, as you commented, we need to we need to search for uh, how. Japan can win by reorienting the course of people's life. I guess we are on the way. Thank you. Uh, I, have a, I have two questions. Uh, the first question, uh, just want to make some comparison with, uh, with the Asian tsunami, for example. Um, um, you know, you, you mentioned about the 
the, the, the imagination of a loser, if you imagine uh, you know, in a thesis, uh, that will give you some solace, some kind of reasoning and justification for the for why the incident happened. Right? I mean, this is an example. In the drawing from the experiences of the Asian tsunami, uh, one is the idea of givenness. The main this is the will of God. So we have to accept it. And according to, because when I, I, I looked at, I was like, I wrote a paper on this uh, uh, conference in New Zealand last year. And I looked at how the Indonesians who are pretty much like you said, Muslims, how they reason this idea of disaster and resilience is for them is the will of God. They say that uh, is the is the, the wrath of God because of uh, humans are deviating from the teachings of God. Christianity also looks at that. You see? So it's a kind of a punishment. Okay, that's from a religious Abrahamic point of view. Then they have their own interpretation, the Indonesians and you know, because they are very much in the indigenous knowledge. They look at the idea of givenness, uh, acceptance, and therefore they are able to reconcile what had happened and move forward. What is how the Japanese people, they have not done any work on the Japanese people, how do they reconcile this? Is that some knowledge or part of their culture or something that they could assist them in order for them to reconcile and move forward? That's number one. I will come back to the second question. A bit provocative, but let me you answer that first. <laughs> Yeah, in the past, people interpreted the, the disaster uh, like tsunami in a religious way, as you explained. Yeah. And uh, I guess it's the same. It was the same in Japan as well. Uh, uh, you know, the disaster, the arrival of a disaster, was interpreted as a kind of um, kindness. I, I mean, uh, it was. It can be interpreted as a sort of punishment, as you explained earlier. But but but. Uh, nowadays, uh, what I mentioned as uh, loser's imagination is a rational imagination. It's not a dream. It's not a religious imagination. Uh, for uh, modern people, uh, what I'm uh, what, what I'm uh, referring to uh, by this concept of uh, loser's imagination is a rational imagination which interprets the situation uh, by analyzing the past mistakes, why we made mistakes, and uh, you know, and uh, based upon the analysis of the past mistakes, we imagine a future. So. It can be. So it where, can where do they draw the strength from? Because you are looking at vulnerable, extreme vulnerabilities when it comes to disaster, mm -hmm. extreme immediate loss of family, you know, death, and all extreme vulnerabilities. And how do they reconcile them? You know, what makes the Japanese people strong that they can go from one disaster to another disaster? You know? Solidarity. Yeah. Solidarity. 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 Yeah. But you want to put an end to it. I say this two years ago. Um, I did a focus group in Tsukuba. And I asked whether people would accept the amendment of the Constitution in order to allow Japan to militarize. And the answer was an overwhelming no. I have never in my life saw a people that have internalized peace so much as the people I talked to. And these people were in 40s and 50s, all accomplished professionals, um, very smart, very talented. Um, and I left the country feeling that, oh boy, Abe is not going to be able to do it. Um, but now you, you gave me another spin to it. And, and this morning I was arguing, um, and, and Ravi um, you know, made a comment, that sometimes the best way to um, analyze the things that are happening to you is not only just to go to the past, but also to examine your thinking about it. 
because you can attract what you think. So if you think in a positive way, positive things can happen. If you think about it in a negative way, negative ways continue to happen. Even though if you analyze the past and you do whatever, all of the things we are taught in college, you can do all of that. Cost analysis, SWOT analysis, run through, it's not going to change anything. You still need to address your attitude about the situation. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, <laughs> encouraging comments. Uh, uh, attitude matters, I think so too. Yeah. And uh, loser's imagination is not necessarily pessimistic, pessimistic imagination. It can be an optimistic yeah. imagination. Loser's imagination can be optimistic, mm -hmm. I think. Okay. Well, yeah. I lost. <coughs> I have nothing to lose, yeah. so I can be optimistic. Yeah. Yeah. This, uh, this, to reflect on uh, the point that you made, Osama, is um, you know when we talk about this idea of violence, uh, of course, uh, the Japanese people gave up the right of how we call it the normalcy of a state. A normal state will have a military an active religion. So Japan has always been a abnormal or a not a normal state in that sense, using a political science uh, definition. But then again, you may find that the push or rationale for militarization, it's not really based on, you know, you can argue that domestic policy and the people, the, uh, what do you call the opinion of people matters and all that. It's very much, if you look at other countries as well, it's very much because of national interest. When Japan sees itself, it's another option, Japan sees itself under threat coming from neighbors who are nuclear powers and their uh, sovereignty are con uh, uh, constantly being challenged. So therefore, what option as a state that you have? So are we capitalize on this as well? And if you, I'm a political scientist, I teach international relations, I think that there's no way out for Japan, but Japan has to militarize, uh, has to nuclearize <laughs> at one point of time. <laughs> if you mentioned about the US-Japan treaty alliance, if there is a slight break in that alliance, and now under Trump, if the United States, Japan, the United US says that uh, you have to take care of your own security. That's it. I think there is no other choice, but Japan has to um, uh, nuclearize to balance the threat. You know, uh, that's, that's it. From, a, from a political science perspective, if I can add to Rodney's comment, yeah. um, there's something called as positive deterrent. So if you look at it from that perspective, you can see yes, there's no other option but to go ahead. Um, because you need that deterrence. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting um, scenario. Maybe I should write a paper on this. <laughs> uh, to see you know, how basically our philosophy about the loser mentality um, can actually stop that from happening again, these defeats. And then we start to win again. Because I, I really think Japan needs a win. Um, and that was another thing I, you know, thought of, you know, coming back to Bangkok. I thought, my God, I mean, from the 70s, as you said, they have shot up, you know, reaching the sky. Um, but there's still something holding them back. You feel it in the end. And, and, and you want them to, to kind of go out of that. Not to burst the seams, so to speak, but at least to just get back to normal again. And I didn't feel that, yeah. Well, uh, I refrain I refrain myself from uh, discussing the militarization of Japan. This is a <laughs> topic. Uh, but, you know, um, I think, you know, winners always continue running. <coughs> winners always continue running. They don't stop. But loser stops. A loser stops to think why he or she lost. And this is important. We need to, sometimes we need to stop to think. We, we do not have to continue running always. We need to stop sometimes to think. 
regularly, I would say. <coughs> we need to stop regularly to look at think. Well, it's very important because it's been 70 years since Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's been 70 years. Yeah, that's a long time. You have a whole new generation. Um, and now that you talk about it as if it's something that is a harbinger of the past and then it's kind of pulling us or pulling the Japanese people. So yeah, it's a valid question. Um, how, do you, how do you internalize it? How do you own it? And how do you tell the public? Because not everybody has the same coping capacity with information. Some people can turn their hair white from black. I mean, if you just tell them that. Some will say, no, it's great. So it's, it's, it's a very sensitive issue that has to be handled with that. I think now, you know, now it's time to stop for Japan. Uh, we need to stop to reflect on the, the legacy of the past generation. And then we have to think over what we are going to hand over to the next generation. Now it's time to stop. Thank you for the entertaining discussion. <laughs> I've held back because you guys are doing a great job. Um, I had one last, uh, I just couldn't hold back at the last moment here. I was thinking of the, the Greek mythology in uh, Eurydice crossing the river Styx. Now, when you've dealt with something like that twice and, and responded with peace, why switch tracks at the last moment and, and, and try to win in the conventional way? You've proved the medal twice. Japan has chosen peace, it's come, come strong through peace twice. And it has a chance not to look back as it crosses the river and make the mistake and get sent back to where the mistakes of the past. So I'm a philosopher, I love rationalizing, but this is the, the philosopher's dilemma. Do we stop and think about it this one more time, or do we give it the last push? make it across, get somewhere it's new, and reflect only after we've achieved something. So, then we'll have a more balanced approach of what, to, what, what would be a better way or, or a new orientation, rather than reflect from the past or from the future. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. I think we have to stop. <coughs> I guess this is the same place <coughs> as you saw. Yeah. And uh, this sign says nuclear energy for a bright future. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this sign was removed after <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, some people, some people <coughs> claim that uh, this time should be stored in museum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to remind the future generations about the wrong predictions. Um, yeah, this morning I mentioned. Um, a theory by uh, a sociologist in Germany. Um, you might have heard of him. His name is Ulrich Beck. He basically said a feature of civilized uh, countries, industrial countries, especially the advanced ones like Japan, like the United States, a feature of those countries is a preoccupation with the future. But because of that, they tend to generate risky societies. If you're always thinking of the future and you're always running, as you said, you're always going to stumble on risky behavior. And, and he said, because of that, and if you internalize that thinking, that knowledge will, will make it happen. So it's mind over matter. Mind over ma matter, from a classical perspective, they're two separate, they live in two separate planes, but if you keep thinking about it, they merge. And, and, and your thoughts, your philosophy actually does affect reality. It has a bearing on it. And sure enough, 
the man as an example. Um, and every time we study a disaster, you see that there was a lot of thinking before the disaster happened. Um, so this is why I, I, I asked that question. Do we need a win? Not in a, in a classical sense, but in a, in a mind and philosophical sense. A public, philosophical sense. Not just one person or the prime minister or the president. I'm talking about at the spiritual level, meaning everybody, the whole country. Moral thing. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much.